Uppsala University, Vice Chancellor Anders Hagfeld, Deputy Vice Chancellor Coco Noreen, the Department of Peace and Conflict Research, and of course, its master's program coordinator, Liana Lopez, who nominated me, the Uppsala Rotary Peace Fellowship Center. Thank you, Taksimiket, for this humbling honor. To be selected as Uppsala University's 2020 Alumnus of the Year is one of the greatest honors of my career. And although few may wish to be associated with year 2020 any longer, this is an association I'm thrilled to accept. I want to not acknowledge Rotary International, who supported my tenure at Uppsala University as a Rotary Peace Fellow. Without you, I would never have had the opportunity to have been inspired in the way I was through my years at the Department of Conflict Research. And to those listening remotely, family, friends, colleagues, and the university community, welcome. And thank you for taking the time to listen to this address. An address that's given me a unique opportunity for some self-reflection, in addition to just a little bit of anxious indigestion. Dag Hammarskjöld famously said, the longest journey is the journey inward. And I'll be honest, preparing for today was quite the journey. This is because some of the stories I'm going to share with you, I don't believe I had properly processed beforehand. And so by reliving those experiences, I was offered some new catharsis, as well as a fresh perspective on a journey I thought had ended more than a year ago. You see, today I want to take you to the Eastern regions of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where from August 2018 to June 2020, the humanitarian community and the affected populations fought the second largest outbreak of Ebola in history and the first ever in a conflict zone. The outbreak would infect over 3,400 people and take 2,287 lives. It would wreak havoc on the very fabric of the people of the Kivus and Dituri and foment deep sentiments of mistrust, anger, and fear. This would all happen against the backdrop of a brutal ongoing conflict which has lasted for decades and resulted in massive displacements, hunger, malnutrition, and a swath of other humanitarian concerns. It's hard to imagine a more desperate and complex situation than Ebola in a war zone. I was deployed in October of 2018 to lead the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent Society's emergency response to this Ebola outbreak. And over the course of the next year, I would take this role twice more, spending more than seven months fighting this invisible enemy with the most honorable and dedicated team of Red Crossers and fellow humanitarians that I have ever had the privilege of serving with. Today, today's about them. Today is about my team who came from all walks of life to respond to this humanitarian emergency. And today is about the Red Cross volunteers who persevered against all odds to control this outbreak within their own communities. But to tell this story, I wanna talk and start with the concept of community trust, or in this case, the lack of it. As many of us have come to know personally under COVID-19, public health interventions like the one we mounted for Ebola are by their very nature clinical. They're designed to apply science to a virological transmission chain to control it, reduce morbidity and mortality and flatten the epidemic curve. But this clinical dynamic doesn't exist in a vacuum because public health interventions are built on a foundation of trust between the responders and the communities. In other words, a convergence of the clinical sciences and society. 
And this convergence is epitomized and most effective when communities not only permit responders to work, but take an active role themselves in combating the threat because they believe in the clinical response and take individual ownership of its success. Often by modifying their daily lives to adopt new and sometimes uncomfortable social norms. Take masks, for instance, a clinical element of the COVID-19 response, but only as effective as the number of people who trust in them. Without trust in masks, no one wears them. And the transmission potential remains high as the infected continue to release aerosols uninhibited. And because of this, we're faced with a harder time to flatten the curve. Conversely, when society trusts in the efficacy of masks and adapts their daily lives, collectively agreeing to go through the torture of foggy glasses, we begin to see a flattening of the curve. A flattening which is compounded when mask wearing is coupled with physical distancing and regular hand washing. Community trust in the clinical com components of a public health intervention is foundational to the success of almost any health operation. As in COVID, it was the same in Ebola and something that we got up close and personal with. The day I took over the operation for the Red Cross in 2018, we had a trust deficit between ourselves and the communities. It was around 1100 in the morning when I received a frantic call from my field coordinator posted in the city of Butembo, about two hours south of where I was stationed at our field headquarters in Beni, North Kivu. Our teams had been attacked. They had been carrying out their duties when a mob formed, fueled by fear and mistrust. Two of the volunteers of the Red Cross National Society the Red Cross of the Democratic Republic of Congo had been taken. They'd been blindfolded, beaten, and had gasoline poured over them. The mob was threatening their lives. And although an active conflict area, this mob had no affiliation to the war. These were regular people, frightened, and convinced that we and the other organizations in the Ebola response were using them, using them for Ebola business. That is, that we had knowingly brought Ebola to their communities to make money off of their suffering. This would become the most frequent rumor we would come across throughout the entire response, but it was one of many. And on top of these vicious rumors that spread like wildfire within the communities in which we worked, the Red Cross and our volunteers faced a unique challenge. We also had to overcome the terrifying visuals that were part and parcel of our specific intervention. You see, those volunteers who'd been taken by the mob were conducting a safe and dignified burial. But what is a safe and dignified burial and, and why are they important? Well, someone who has died from the virus is most infectious at time of death and shortly thereafter. So managing with dignity and respect their careful interment is essential to controlling the transmission chain. This is especially important in places with limited access to healthcare as community burials are commonplace and lack the infrastructure to protect people during burial rites. Burial practices, which sometimes include touching or washing the body, exacerbate this risk. As we learned from the West African crisis, 60% of all Ebola cases in Guinea were linked to unprotected community burials. And in parts of Sierra Leone, this figure climbed to 80%. In other words, the majority 
of Ebola cases during the largest outbreak in history were linked to unprotected community burials. So safely managing the dead is one of the key clinical interventions to stop Ebola. And in this crisis, as in West Africa, the Red Cross was charged to oversee this important role. But what does it look like in practice? And more importantly, what does it look like from the perspective of the communities we were serving? Just imagine your mother, who's had a fever for the past few days, began vomiting, had diarrhea, and now hemorrhaging has died in her bed. You're not sure what's happened, but the grief is overwhelming. And then all of a sudden, four white Toyota Land Cruisers appear at your home and people in vests that you've never met before step out. They begin to ask you questions about who she's been in contact with and whether you've cared for her. Cared for her? Of course you've cared for her. This is your mother. And then a 12 person team descends and people begin putting on what seem like spacesuits. They begin disinfecting your home. You notice they're careful to be respectful, but you're still in shock. Someone is talking to you about what's going on and what they're doing, but you're not really hearing them. And then they begin to put her body in a body bag and carry her away for a burial that although you will be part of and your customs respected, you've never imagined. Only hours before you had been comforting her. And then, then you begin to see that this is the cr cruelty of Ebola. For it is a virus spread through love. It is something fundamental in all of us to take care of our loved ones when they're sick. And when your mother is ill, all you wanna do is be there with her, help her, comfort her. But that very act of offering that care is how the virus spreads. And because you've cared for her, you're now going to an isolation room in an Ebola treatment center to hope and to pray that you don't have it and that you won't suffer the same fate. It's a living nightmare. And when your neighbors witness this, it's terrifying. And they begin to talk. What's going on? Who are these people? What are they doing? Where are they taking them? And this fear snowballs. It escalates. It takes on a very different form turns into rumor, it turns into mistrust, and eventually it can turn into anger. And this, this was the maelstrom that our volunteers found themselves in on the 1st of October, 2018, when they were taken by that mob. They were at the very center of a whirlwind of community fear. By some miracle, they managed to escape. They broke free of the crowd and ran to a local clinic where they hid beneath a bed for over an hour while the community searched for them. Once the police arrived, the crowd dispersed and our volunteers were transported to a local hospital where they were treated for their injuries, severe but not critical. This, this is the impact of a lack of trust in the public health response. It hinders our action and puts our staff and by effect, the communities at risk. And when insecurity would halt the entire Ebola response, the caseloads would spike and we'd lose what we'd fought so hard to gain. Not only this though, but the communities, because they didn't trust us, wouldn't alert us if one of their family members had died from Ebola, which continued the practice of unprotected community burials 
and led to more local transmission and a further spread of the virus. So to turn this around, we had to change our collective strategy. We had to get, engage communities on their terms, listen to them and adapt our response to their needs. In this case, we had to better explain the necessity of safe and dignified burials and what it meant if those space suits showed up. We had to get on the radio waves, get into the communities, talk to people, listen to them, and modify the way we approached our intervention. We had to show the people that we were hearing them and we were course corrected. And we did. In October 2018, our community feedback system, which we'd established to listen to the rumors and fears of the communities, had identified issues with safe and dignified burials as the second largest fear in Butembo. But six months later, and after a community engagement blitz, where we disseminated the importance of our intervention on TV, radio, and even through song, these issues had completely disappeared from the top of our feedback. We'd listened. We'd listened to the communities and addressed their fears in a way that had resonated with them. And this change in perception resulted in an increase in the number of alerts we were receiving. In October 2018, only 20% of safe and dignified burial alerts were coming from the communities. While in February, 2019, that percentage had risen to 81%. That increase was because we had changed our approach and built trust with the communities. How do we know that we built their trust? Because you would never call a space suited stranger to bury your mother unless you believed in what they were doing. You see, too often in the rush to support as many people as we can, we fail to involve the beneficiaries of our action in what we do or understand the perceptions and complexity of their realities. In contrast, when we do listen and adapt to what people tell us, the impact on our work is tremendous. And although the Ebola response would continue on for a further year and a half, this strategy is ultimately how we got Ebola under control. And if this is how we beat Ebola, it's also how we're going to beat COVID. COVID-19 will not be fought in cabinet or a house of representatives. This fight will be fought and won in the communities and by the communities. And it will be a function of how much they trust and own the response. This was my lesson from Ebola. And I believe it can be our collective lesson for COVID-19. And this is why the Red Cross and others have also invested just so much into risk communication and community engagement in the global COVID-19 response. To date, 156 of our Red Cross national societies have directly and indirectly reached over 430 million people around the world with COVID-19 information. It is our largest global intervention in the COVID response and stems in many ways from the lessons we learned from the Ebola operation. Trust, it's the foundation of public health response. But if trust is one thing, what else is foundational? Our hands. If public health responses are fought and won in the communities, it's on the backs of the community members leading the charge the local standard bearers who are ready and willing to lead by example, assume great personal risk and rally their neighbors. Those who embody 
service above self. The doctors, nurses, and paramedics who are working overtime to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and the Red Cross volunteers who were the core of our response to Ebola. <laughs> and if it's not already abundantly clear, today's story is about them, about our volunteers, our community heroes, all 12 million of them around the world who are the center of our operations worldwide are often the first responders after a crisis, providing unparalleled access to the communities we serve. These folks are amazing. And without them, we'd never be able to do anything. They've even saved me from myself, advising on how best to approach a situation in what's for me a new and unknown context. I've been spared more than a few times from a violent bout of food poisoning or making a dangerous cultural misstep just by listening to our volunteers. And this is what, this is part of what makes them unique and why they're so important. Whereas I come in as an international humanitarian responder and have to learn a context to try to make sense of things, they know it. They know the people and can work within a complex, chaotic, but familiar disaster environment. And this is one of the reasons behind the humanitarian community's emphasis on local leadership in emergency response. In 2016 at the World Humanitarian Summit, the grand bargain confirmed a commitment from the largest humanitarian donors and aid agencies that humanitarian action would be as local as possible and as global as necessary. Because local actors often have the best understanding of the context and the acceptance of the people in need of assistance and protection. This is a bottom up approach that seeks to ensure that the communities are in the driver's seat of the humanitarian responses that affect them. Where international humanitarians come in, like myself come in, is to support this local leadership. And it follows an assessment of the national capacity to manage the crisis on their own. Of course, if the scale of the emergency is too large, or there's a gap that can be filled by international expertise, only then am I brought in, but it is to augment those local capacities, not replace them, to listen and to mobilize the weight of the global Red Cross, Red Crescent movement to support their domestic response. But leadership remains local and it builds on community networks, on our volunteers who give so much and sometimes at great personal risk to respond. And this is something that we don't often talk about, about the cost of doing this work. I can't speak for the volunteers or the impact that burying highly infectious Ebola cases in a war zone would have had on them how it would have felt to have neighbors harass, beat, and ostracize you. But I can tell you from personal experience that responding to Ebola in Eastern DR Congo had an impact. It changed me, it changed a lot of us. So I wanna continue with a story that was for me impactful but was not unique out there. I can't describe the fear that one has when faced with this virus, but I can give you a hint and a taste of what our volunteers faced every day that they put their boots on. It was, uh, it was 8 a.m. In, in Beni, North Kivu, and I was in my office on the third floor of our field headquarters 
we'd taken over a hotel called La Reference, and I had occupied the entire building for our office and our home. I was enjoying my morning coffee when my head of security came through the door and said, tu dois descendre, you have to come down. Unquestioning, I followed him down the winding steps to find our receptionist for the hotel, the gentleman who'd be giving us our keys every day, standing at the door with a thermoflash temperature gun at his temple, the display blinking red and reading 38.4 degrees. A fever is one of the first symptoms of Ebola. And Benny, at that time, was the epicenter of the crisis. Our algorithm for elevated temperatures played out in my head. Um, reassure the individual, ask probing questions to establish the possibility for infection, and retake their temperature 10 minutes later to cross-reference the initial results. Done. Still 38.4. And he lives within the community at the epicenter of this crisis. This, this could be Ebola. But fortunately, our infection prevention and control measures have worked. And he's been stopped at the door before being able to potentially contaminate anyone inside. But he was here yesterday, handing us our keys how thorough had our control measures been then? Could he have been let in without being checked? How long has he had a fever? My mind was racing. Not more than three days before had the UN announced that a daily worker within their facility had tested positive for the virus. Was it our turn? We established a team to transport him to the hospital to the Ebola Treatment Center, where he would be examined. And in the event that he was positive, uh, positive, properly taken care of. I then gather our office together in the garden to brief them on what's going on. We explain the situation and the action we've taken. We remind everyone of the no touch policy and to be diligent with hand washing. We'll await the test results and take it from there. I go around the circle to ask everyone how they feel. Fine, fine. But people are visibly keeping more distance from one another. The last person to speak is our safe and dignified burials coordinator, who just returned from a side conversation with the hotel staff. He's deadpan. Our waitress, the woman who's been handing us our food, our drinks, taking our glasses, has not reported in for two days. She'd secretly left work because she'd had a fever. You can feel the weight of the news hit the team. I'm standing with hardened, hardened professionals who've risked their lives to come to this place and respond to Ebola, and this news knocks the wind out of them. The woman we've had closest contact with, without touching, had a fever, and now her colleague has the same symptom. In our office, in our home, in the epicenter of this crisis. We thought Ebola had come to our door. Some of you may identify with this fear. If you've been a COVID-19 contact or tested positive for the virus and were waiting to see how your symptoms would progress. The toughest part is that wait, that what if. And as we waited for our teams to contact trace our waitress back to the hospital and get the test results back from both of them, we were given a taste of what the communities and our volunteers were going through each and every day. 
fortunately both came back negative and are safe. But this fear and this experience was not unique or special in this Ebola outbreak or the outbreak in West Africa. Thousands went through this and much, much worse. So if anyone deserves the honor of this award, it's the 3,124 volunteers of the Red Cross of the Democratic Republic of Congo, who each and every day put on their boots and fought the toughest battle of their lives. They faced that fear head on and beat Ebola, but it had an impact. And although your action in front of Netflix may not seem as dramatic as those volunteers or that story, we have to recognize that there's a cost of battling this pandemic from our homes because we're all community responders. We're all volunteers fighting COVID. We've all faced the fear of this virus. And because of that, we're tired, we're fed up. And all of us just want this to be over. And that's okay. Those emotions are real, they're valid, and they're not unique. They're shared globally. So if the Ebola response has any application to your lives, it's that we need to be honest with ourselves about the impact that being a community responder has. To admit that sometimes we might need a break and that by asking for one is not weakness. In fact, it's strength because you can't care for anyone else unless you've cared for yourself just as our volunteers, it will take many of us a long while to come down from the collective trauma of COVID-19. So pace yourselves, be honest with yourselves, and if you need a break, take one. So we can continue the fight in our communities, but equally prepare for the ones to come. And if you ever find yourself in a moment of self-doubt and anxiety, just think back to that old Swedish saying, det or ingen ko på isen. There's no cow on the ice. Or don't worry. Because we're all in this together in a trust-based, community-driven response. And on this foundation, we can flatten the curve. I wanna conclude by thanking, of course, the volunteers and my team for their dedication and hard work over so many sleepless nights and long years. But I also wanna thank the thousands of people whom I will never meet, but whose generosity funds this work. The funding that comes from the compassionate hearts of the world and makes these compassionate acts possible. Disasters are happening everywhere. I'm giving this address from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, where I'm now leading the International Federation's response to the population movement associated with the crisis in Tigray. And as we speak now, new Ebola outbreaks have recently been declared in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and again in the Eastern region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. According to the UN in 2021, a record 235 million people, that's one in 33 people worldwide, will need humanitarian assistance and protection. It's nearly a 40% increase on 2020 and is almost entirely the result of COVID-19. The pandemic has triggered the deepest, reception, deepest global recession since the 1930s, and extreme poverty has risen for the first time in 22 years. School closures 
have affected 91% of students worldwide with untold costs on their futures. And COVID-19 isn't happening in isolation. 97.6 million people were affected by disasters in 2019, and the last 10 years were the hottest on record. We can expect climatological disasters to continue, if not gain momentum, <clears throat> further increasing the global humanitarian need. Our work is not getting easier. In fact, we're being called to do more with less. And this will be no more apparent than in the coming years when financing for humanitarian and development aid will be markedly stretched from the economic ripple effects of COVID. So to you, the students of Uppsala University, you've got a bit of work ahead of you, but you're on the right path by being part of one of the best learning institutions in the world. So give back embody service above self, but most importantly, take care of yourselves because we'll rely on you to continue the fight in your communities against COVID-19 as well as the crises of the future. Thank you Uppsala University for this great honor. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing your experiences, both moving and inspiring. We will now move on to our students from the master's program in peace and conflict studies who have prepared some questions for you. Uh, here with us today are Hassini Ronsala Lianage, Andy Fallon, Tanishri Rao, and Jonas Simons. Let's start with Hassini. Thank you, Jamie, uh, for joining us uh, today and for that wonderful lecture. It was amazing. Uh, so starting off the Q&A, as a current master's student at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research, Research at Uppsala University, I know we are given a deep understanding about uh, multiple aspects related to the field of peace and conflict and multiple other opportunities to enhance the skills and experience. So I'd like to know how complementary was the learning experience within the master's program for your current position? Thanks. It's a, it's a brilliant question. Um, and I, I, I recall back to some times in, in Uppsala University where I was sitting in that methods class and wondering, oh my, will statistics really be applicable? Uh, and what I can, I can say confidently now after a few years in the field is yes, yes it is. Um, what I learned from Uppsala University was about research methods and analysis and operational planning and humanitarian response is all about collecting massive amount of amounts of data and synthesizing it to produce a, a coherent operational plan. Coherent operational response, key messages that drive the international community to come in with funding and research. What statistics and methods gave me was that basis to learn qualitative and quantitative peace research methods and how to apply that to an emergency needs assessment. I did this in rural South Sudan where I probably shouldn't have tried to get a statistical sample in an insecure environment, but I was able to adapt the lessons that I learned from Uppsala to do a multi-sectoral comprehensive emergency needs assessment in the north of the country. I did this in, in, in Cyclone Adai, where myself and the assessment teams went into rural Mozambique to start looking at how we start to understand the complex realities of the humanitarian situation following one of the worst cyclones in the Southern Hemisphere's history. But taking that data and then being able to analyze it and produce key messages and produce an operational strategy got its foundation for me at Uppsala University. And so if there are people in the current methods class that are worried about whether or not this is applicable, I can tell you if you're a humanitarian, it is. And it's been extremely helpful in putting me on the right path to be uh, an operational leader. Thank you. Let's move on to Andy. Hi, Jamie. Uh, I wanna thank you uh, for your lecture and 
um, for your authentic reflection um, of your experiences. Um, I think there are, are many students and, and job seekers out there wondering, especially during, during this time, um, wondering how you got your start um, at the Red Cross. Um, so my question is, uh, what was your path to start volunteering there? Um, and before you got to a leadership position, how did you kind of evolve through the organization? Thank you. Sure. Um, I mean, specifically for the Red Cross, but I think it has applicability beyond. The Red Cross was founded on this principle of voluntary service. Um, Rotary International has something similar with service above self. Um, so I think the first key message that we all sort of have to switch our, our minds to is that nobody's above volunteering. Um, and you don't just do volunteer work for your CV or the rest of it. You do it because it opens you up to experience and new experience that you wouldn't have had you just decided to stay at home or continue reading or the rest of it, which is all important. But volunteering gives you an entry point and it gave me an entry point that was unique. I got my start with the Red Cross, with the Canadian Red Cross in, uh, in 2009 as a disaster management volunteer. Um, we responded to everything from house fires to windstorms at three in the morning, sitting in community centers, to the, one of the largest, larger disasters in Canada, the 2013 Alberta floods. I took the experiences that I had from, from volunteering with the Canadian Red Cross and, and in 2011, I went to Cambodia, uh, not as a volunteerist, but as a real volunteer. And I funded myself to go and be there for four months with a local NGO doing monitoring and evaluation. It was a rotary funded initiative. And fundamentally that opened up the space for the Rotary Peace Fellowship. And once I got to Uppsala University, I moved on and took an unpaid internship in South Africa um, with OCHA. And I don't necessarily support unpaid internships. I think everyone has the, the right and deserves to be paid for the work they do. But this was what was on offer to me. And at the end of the day, it opened me up to an incredible opportunity in Southern Africa, which ultimately paved the way for the rest of my career. That experience in Ocha got me a contract with the United Nations on the island of Mauritius. I'll tell you that was a really, really rough mission living on the beach, but I worked for, for the government helping to design their National Emergency Operations Center. That then translated into working for uh, in, in 2015 on the food insecurity situation that was the result of the El Nino drought in Southern Africa. So the long and short of this is, is that Volunteering gives you an entry point. It opens a door. It's unique in that. And nobody's better than volunteering. So take that forward and through your, your university degree and beyond, continue that spirit of service above self, of voluntary service, because it will really help build your career. Wonderful. Panishri, you have a question. Hi everyone, thanks a lot for having me here and Jamie, thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. I think that that answer that you gave for that question is, is a really interesting one and it opens up well for, for my next question. There are of course many differences in students' socioeconomic backgrounds and you mentioned a little bit about the privilege of being able to do unpaid internships which shouldn't necessarily be the norm. Um, I think there's a lot of advice of, of advice that you might have that's really valuable for, for students, particularly in the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies. So reflecting on your own experience, I wonder what advice you would give to PCR students. Yeah, sure. I think it's the advice that I've given myself over the years. Um, and it's about being laser focused on what you want to do in the future, um, where you're going, what your trajectory is and helping to establish a brand around that, a personal brand based on your direction of travel. Now, that's not to say that as different experiences come and change you and, and different opportunities come and you move with them, that's great. But that direction of travel is really important. And that personal brand is really important because then when employers and others 
are looking for a certain profile, they associate your brand and you with the need. You know, I'm a global head of emergency operations right now for the IFRC, and it's built on the brand that I am a humanitarian emergency responder. I don't work in, in, in planning, monitoring, and, and evaluation and reporting. I don't work in information management. I work in humanitarian emergency response as a leadership profile. And by building that brand, you're given what you give an organization an ability to put you on a trajectory towards that. So build the brand, be laser focused on your future, but also open to new experiences that change that trajectory. But once that brand is there, capitalize on it, build on it and sell it because that's how you'll get that entry point to those big jobs. That's excellent advice. Uh, next question from Jonah. Hi, Jamie. Uh, I'd also like to thank you for your presentation and for taking our questions today. Building off of Andy and Tanishree's questions, international organizations are notoriously bureaucratic, um, but you've built your career from humble beginnings and now working in an executive role. I was wondering if you could talk about what you think has helped you find success at IFRC. It's <laughs> a really good question, Jonah. Um, humility? Uh, is my reaction to that. Um, subordinating your ego, I think, is the most important part of, of being a leader. Um, volunteering and serving at the ground floor helps to establish that, but our job as leaders is to take that into the executive space. You know, in, in emergency response, there's this principle of, of authoritarian leadership and consensus-based leadership, and there's a spectrum between them. Um, the best humanitarian leaders are somewhere over here in that you open up the space for your team to feel comfortable to provide information on what they've seen on the ground. Because in complex, chaotic environments, no single person is able to come up with a response plan. We have to move away from this concept of leader as hero to leader as facilitator. And that requires humility to be able to open up the space for your team to contribute. And when it's necessary, you make that call. But humility is number one, because by having a humble approach, you not only support an operation, it also helps you to see things from the perspective of the communities you serve. We need to bring ourselves down from our egos and bring ourselves really rooted in the realities of the people that we serve. And by being a humble leader, I think that is the most important thing that I can, I can say from my personal experience. Wow. Yes. Plenty to learn from you. Uh, Hassini, again, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Uh, so I'd like to know uh, how you perceive the differences between field work within your emergency operations and work at the headquarters? Yeah, it's also a really good question. Um, and there's this, there's this great book by, by Anton Meyer called Once an Eagle um, that deals with this under the context of, of World War I, World War II, and, and uh, in, within the frame of the, the military environment. But it, ha it discusses this dichotomy between the command staff and the general staff. The command staff are the ones in the field, the general staff are the ones at the headquarters doing the politics. And I think that's an interesting way to look at field work versus HQ work, because what the book presents is this concept that one might be more important than the other, that it's best to be in the field. And although I agree with that in a lot of ways, there's a necessity for both, because field work is where you earn your stripes. It's where you learn what a community is. It's where you get different exposure and you learn the nuance that you'd never be able to learn in a textbook or in a course. But HQ is where you take that experience to drive forward better policies that let your field people meet the needs of more, uh, of, of greater affected populations. So field work is where you learn. It's where you have the most impact and it's where you as a person are able to have a personal connection with the people that you serve. But our job as humanitarians is to take that 
and bring it back up and to influence the global realities to make sure that we have a better impact on the ground. So they're intertwined and they're really important that we make that linkage between the two because only then are we able to better serve the, uh, the affected populations. Thank you. Andy, next question from you. Yes, um, I think in your lecture you talked sufficiently about some of the great um, challenges you face in your job. Um, perhaps you might share what you feel are some of um, some things that are the most rewarding um, in your work. What makes you happy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a fantastic question as well. Um, and, and of course, you know, being on a distribution and, and seeing the people that we serve and, and being there with the communities is incredibly rewarding. Um, and I've learned a lot from that experience. But I also really appreciate the new perspectives that this work gives. Um, I remember a story, I was in Zimbabwe on my very first humanitarian operation. I was an operations manager uh, for a food security crisis. And we were way up in the north of the country um, in the Land Cruiser and I was with my, my great driver Fide. And um, we were driving down the road and this little sparrow uh, hit the car um, and was stuck in the front grill of our car. So unfortunately, uh, she passed away there, but we, we stopped on the side of the road to go and, and, and deal with this. And this older gentleman comes out and goes to the front of the grill, stops what we're doing, pulls out this sparrow, and two little kids, four and five, run out of the village, and she, he takes this sparrow and he gives it to them. And me from my Western North American background, I thought, what is going on? And this guy through my translator says, or through my driver says, this might be the first meat that they get in weeks. And right then and there, it was mind blowing because it's a different perspective than you've ever gotten before. And it helps to shape how you approach your next response. I love seeing people's faces when we, we do distributions in the bush. Don't get me wrong. But for me, what's rewarding is incorporating these new views into how we reach more people in a better way and in a more accountable way in the future in order to serve them better. And that's what's the most rewarding part of this work, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Tanushree, next question from you. Yes, I think there are many ideals of what it's like to work in a humanitarian setting, particularly as students in peace and conflict, but the reality can often be quite removed from, from what that ideal looks like. Is there any such thing as a normal day for you? And if so, could you explain what that looks like? Sure. Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, because often what's portrayed is that I come in with a parachute and you know, you're, you're, you're riding in on a chopper and it's exciting and it's, it's super cool. Uh, and those days happen and they're fantastic and they're really exciting and they bring you back to, to the adventure of this work. But a normal day for me as a, as a humanitarian operational leader is a lot of meeting rooms. Uh, it's a lot of emails, it's a lot of teleconferences uh, it's not as adventurous uh, as it may seem at face value. Value. My job as, as an operations lead is to coordinate large teams across many different sectors to reach the affected population in a humanitarian setting. For instance, when I was one of the first people into um, the affected area after Cyclone Adai hit Mozambique, and getting there was amazing. Um, you know, we had a team from the National Society and a photographer and myself and uh, one of the heads of country for, for uh, a National Society in Mozambique. And we got into a car and we drove north and then we chartered a helicopter and we swooped in to Beira and it was fascinating. It was amazing. But then most of the rest of my job was setting up an emergency operations center for the Red Cross and coordinating teams on the ground. It was a lot of emails, it was a lot of telecons, and it was a lot of meetings. Because 
what's really important for organizations like the International Federation of the Red Cross is coordination. It's where my focus is and it's where our mandate comes from. Just like the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs within the UN, the IFRC is a similar organization in that our focus is coordinating partners. And so in Mozambique, it was about coordinating different emergency response units to go to different places, coordinating with the United Nations and the UNDAC teams, coordinating with our structures, coordinating externally. But that coordination is done on a laptop, but it's absolutely essential to the effective management of an emergency operation. Because if you don't coordinate, you have a million people running in a million directions. So there are those in my teams that are fantastic in the bush all the time and doing great work out there. But the normal day for me on an emergency response is coordinating. And it often happens in a meeting room as close to the emergency as I can get. We're all administrators somehow, I suppose. Uh, Jonah, next question from you. Yeah, as you, um, you might remember from your time in Uppsala, uh, maintaining a healthy work-life balance is highly valued here in Sweden. So how do you maintain uh, your balance between family life and work in such a demanding job? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and it's not easy uh, at all. Uh, my wife and I have done many, many years of long distance to support this work. Uh, she's also a humanitarian with the IFRC, which makes it easier. Um, we understand each other when on a Friday night we get a call and have to start packing our bags. That helps. Um, but this work demands a lot at the professional and the personal level. Uh, and it's important to recognize that there is a need to acknowledge that before you get into it. Friends, family, comfort, um, they change. You know, I had to give up a lot from my hometown in Calgary to become a humanitarian responder, and I don't go home very often. So your friend group changes, your comfort changes, and then in some places, your security changes and your safety changes. Um, and this has an impact as well. It doesn't come easy, this work. Uh, so you have to be willing to make some of those sacrifices. But as we talked about before, it's one of the most rewarding things in the world. So if you're willing to take those sacrifices and make those sacrifices for family life too, in some cases, then you'll get an incredible amount out of it. But I do want to say, I don't have the answers for this yet. I don't think anybody's got the answers for this. So when you approach this work, if you have a better idea how to balance work and life, call me and call my wife because we'd love to get a different opinion on how to do it. <laughs> Noted. Uh, Hassini, next question from you. Yeah, uh, so personally, I've, um, I've always had a great interest in, in working as a humanitarian responder in operations in conflict torn areas where our services are needed the most. And also I come from Sri Lanka country, which was prone to nearly a 30 year long war. And I know how challenging it can be to live even on the opposite side of the conflict zone. And I assume challenges are even uh, greater if one is to work at the heart of a conflict zone. So I'd like to know how challenging it can be to, uh, to work in a conflict zone and how those challenges can be well managed so that one could still pursue his or her passion for field work? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think the key to work in insecure environments is prioritizing security. Um, this is not something that is an add-on to an operation. It's not something that is an add-on to your daily life. Uh, this is an approach to life when you're operating in these environments. There's a protocol for everything, but there's not a protocol for how to operate in these environments. There are structures and frameworks that you have to adapt and ensure are most effective in those places. But prioritizing security management of yourself and your team is the most essential. And at the same time, it's protecting yourself. 
So if your security management is the outward, you have to look at how do you protect yourself inwardly. And I think this is something we just don't talk about enough about the impact of this work. Uh, and if you're gonna find yourself in, in, in conflict zones or disaster zones in the future, we really have to be honest and you have to be honest about what the impact is on your personal psyche. Um, and that by taking a break, it's not a sign of weakness, like I mentioned. It's important to recognize those waves of stress and how stress impacts us. And when you hit the, just before that peak comes, you recognize it and you take a step to change it and course correct, take a weekend off, go out for dinner with friends, you know, have, have a juice, whatever it is, but do what is most necessary to you to avoid that peak, find it here and then move down beforehand. So security management is number one for external, but you have to look inside yourself and be honest with yourself about how a situation is impacting you. The biggest lesson I learned and what has become my focus for the last two years has been self-care on operation as a direct result of the Ebola response. I started losing my hair at the age of 32 because of what we went through out there. And I don't want others to do the same. There's a lot of trauma that comes with this, this work and there's a lot of trauma that comes with it being a paramedic, an ICU doctor, in the military, the rest of it. So being honest with the impact that these things have on yourselves and taking adequate steps to protect yourself is the most important thing you can do to be able to work in these contexts effectively in the future. Thank you. Andy. I think it's clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated and made more complex pretty much every development challenge or emergency challenge um, globally. Um, my question is, once this, the COVID-19 pandemic ends, whenever that may be, what do you expect to be um, sort of the biggest post-COVID-19 challenge that you um, foresee facing? Yeah. Not going back to the way things were, I think is going to be the biggest challenge for all of us. You know, we've all learned some very, very valuable lessons from COVID, despite how much it's impacted us collectively. You know, remote working is possible. And in fact, when you are a globally networked organization, it's important to recognize that remote working is a valuable and valid way to run operations and programs. We've also learned that this importance of self-care is really important uh, because all of us sit in front of Netflix and we're all impacted by it. And that we have to make sure that this is the front and center of HR policies. We've also learned that human resilience is incredibly remarkable, but that local capacities to respond have been what's gotten us through COVID-19. You don't always need parachuting international humanitarians. Although that is necessary in certain contexts with large scale emergencies, it will always be. We also have learned that fairness and equity in, in vaccine distributions is a long way off and that we still have a long way to go to be able to have fairness and equity between the global north and the global south. So my opinion, and it's, it's a humble opinion, is that what will be most challenging will be not reverting to 2019 when it's over. To take the lessons that we've learned from COVID and apply them. I think we've got a once in a lifetime opportunity to do things differently. But experience shows us that we often go back to what's normal, what's comfortable, what's easy. So the biggest challenge will be for all of us to avoid this natural tendency and use what we've learned from COVID to shape a different and more equitable future. That's great. Panoshree. Thank you. I think representation really matters when we talk about that, um, that equitable future that you mentioned. There are a lot of stereotypes of people, communities and countries that receive aid, and that includes portrayals of helplessness and dependence when that's not necessarily true, nor is it necessarily an ethical image to, to project. 
You talked a bit about valuing local leadership and capacity and using the IFRC's resources to support domestic response to crises. Are there any other ways that you work to empower the communities that you work with and importantly, to break these stereotypes? Woof, that's a fantastic question. Uh, there is a code of conduct uh, that has that the Red Cross and, and has put out many years ago that has 10 tenants to avoid exactly what you're talking about. My wife is a communications um, delegate, a uh, communications lead within the IFRC, so I want to go into one of them. Um, and many of the images that you saw in the presentation were taken by her on her missions to Ebola as well. But one of the ways that we don't objectify beneficiaries, clients, is to ensure that we put them at the forefront of their response and that they are the ones that contribute to it. So we include them in the planning processes. This is the local leadership thing that I was talking about, making sure that they design the responses that are most effective to them, that we only call in international resources when we need it and when they have asked for it. But when it comes to how to portray that dynamic externally, it's not about taking photos anymore of kids with flies on their eyes. And when we portray these things globally, we want to show people in local people in positions of power. That's to say that they're the ones that are leading it. They've got the vests on. They're the ones commanding resources. They're the ones that are commanding their response. And us, as international humanitarians, are in the background. We don't want any more of this parachuting, cowboy, hip-hop, whatever. It's about making sure that we call those resources when we need them, but then the external communications focuses on local leadership. And if you take photos of beneficiaries or clients, it's with their permission, and that they are the ones consulted in the way their image is used to not take advantage of their suffering. Brilliant point, thank you. Jonah, next question from you. Yeah, Jamie, you talked earlier about humility and subordinating your ego as a leader. And I was wondering if you could talk more about how you see yourself as a leader, um, particularly in a field where marginalization and imbalances of power are longstanding issues. Yeah, it's a great question. And it ties back to Tanrishi's previous point. Um, my job is to mobilize the, the global power of the Red Cross Resident, Red Crescent movement to support domestic operations. Um, and so when we do that, it has to be behind the national society's response to be able to balance out this power dynamic that is natural with global South and global North relations. And when we do this, when we put the national society at the forefront of the operation, then we take our direction from them. In the way that I'm, I'm leading the operation here in Ethiopia right now, it's in support and at the request of the national society. They're in the driver's seat. They're commanding the entire operation. And our job is to sit behind them and support them in what they need. This helps to evaluate that dynamic that you're talking about. But at the same time, how do we mobilize our resources to have that same approach? And I think it comes back to being a leader who opens up the space to coordinate between a whole bunch of different people from a whole bunch of different walks of life and set the direction of travel based on that local response. We bring in people that we need, but they're the ones that make sure that the national society and the local organizations feel the impact of that support structure that we bring. And humility on all of our parts is critical in doing that. Thank you. Hassini, another question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so given the importance of uh, context-oriented responses, I'd like to know how you work with other organizations particularly organizations with local expertise and leadership uh, to reach the best outcomes? Or as you mentioned earlier, how do you try to make humanitarian action as local as possible together with these local organizations? Yeah, great question. 
Um, and it comes back to the point we made earlier on, on coordination. Um, we, you know, in, in Mozambique, it's, it's the greatest example. Um, we had, I think it was over 500 humanitarian responders arriving every day uh, for the first week or so of that operation. The emergency operations center at the small Beira airport was just inundated with thousands of people joining. And so when you've got that kind of a massive scale operation that has overshadowed some of the local capacities, it's important that there are several structures for how we all plan and task those agencies so that when they come in, they're able to come into a coordinated structure that says, this is the situation, this is where we need you, this is where we understand your added value is, and this is how you can support capacity building of the local organizations. And I think this is one of the critical things that the Red Cross does in a different way because we work through our national societies. But when we come in, the internationals, we coordinate ourselves, but it's all to support the development and the capacity development of those national societies. To say that when we leave, because we will, that they are better off than they were before. And that we've taken active steps to build their capacities through this emergency response. You know, you can learn a lot in a workshop, you can learn a lot in a textbook, but if you are working hand in hand with somebody in an emergency operations center in Beira and trying to move logistic supply lines from Dubai through Maputo and up, that is how you learn to be a logistician of the National Society, working hand in hand with those people that know it and have done it globally, but then bring it back to where you are and build you up through the operation. This is national society development or organizational development in emergencies. And it has to be the foundation of how we approach emergency response. And that way we build through crisis and we use crisis as an opportunity for the future. Wonderful. Andy. Jamie, you've shared just a slice of the context and communities in which you were charged to uh, work in effectively. Um, do you feel your degree at the uh, Department of Peace and Conflict Research in Uppsala um, prepared you for the uh, cross-cultural nature of your everyday work? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, I think what's so amazing about a university is that it gives you a foundation. It provides a baseline, but it doesn't provide everything. And if we try to have an expectation that a, the university is going to prepare you for every dynamic, then I think that's an unmanageable expectation. But what Uppsala did for me was gave me a baseline to start from. It gave me a taste of many different things that then shaped my future. And then just like we talked about before, taking those tastes, taking those experiences and applying them to the field and learning through the experiences that were offered by the field, that's what makes you. So it's not one or the other, it's that both together are really critical in making who you are. Uppsala gave the foundation. It gave me an entry point. It gave me my AFP, the, uh, the, the applied field experience with UNOCHA. But going out into Zimbabwe and meeting those two kids on the side of the road, that's what made me but I could have never done it had it not been for the Rotary Peace Fellowship and what Uppsala was. Great. Tanushree. Thanks, Jamie. My last question to you is similar to some of the, um, the power-related um, themes that we've been talking about lately. So many organizations and individuals in the global development, um, emergency relief and other aid related fields are taking action to remove colonial structures and white saviorism from their sectors. What does that mean to you? And do you see any challenges to decolonization in the emergency relief field? I think it's what we were talking about a little bit with COVID-19 too, and not going back to what's normal and comfortable. Um, I think one of the major challenges that we have, and the grand bargain, it was a great initiative as local as possible, as global as necessary. 
but the reality is, is that many humanitarian operations are still run by the largest aid agencies and by the largest bureaucratic infrastructures to go in and support domestic response and sometimes overshadow it. It's unfortunately the way the system has been designed. That will be the biggest challenge is to overcome that dynamic as well as the funding dynamic that supports it. Because at the end of the day, the only way anybody can respond in a, in a community is with funding to back them up. And the global architecture for humanitarian financing favors the largest aid agencies. The grand bargain started a conversation, but it sure hasn't finished it. And so the biggest thing for all of us to do and to recognize is that we have a long way to come in terms of funding humanitarian operations and how we program them at the ground. There are immense hurdles and challenges to overcome in the future, but at least we're starting to have this conversation and starting to be honest about what we have to do to overcome it. And just like we mentioned before, it's all about as local as possible and as global as necessary and revamping our thought and our thinking towards that. Wonderful. Now it's time for our last questions for, question for today. And Jonah, welcome. Jamie, I just, again, on behalf of all of us students, I wanna thank you again for your time today. Um, we all know that the past year has made it very difficult to plan for the future, but could you describe your goals and where you'd like to go from here? Uh, well, next week I'm going to travel up north to Ethiopia, to the north of Ethiopia to support the affected populations out there. From there, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna continue on as a global head of emergency operations and wherever I'm called by the IFRC, that's where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna keep that field focus for a while. And then I'm gonna do exactly like we talked about earlier and bring that field focus north, up to Geneva, up to New York, up to the headquarters to make sure that we as a global community bring in the perspectives of the communities. That's the future for me, although I don't really have a clear trajectory other than just to keep on it right now because this is the most exciting thing that I've ever been part of. Wonderful, thank you so much, both to you, Jamie, and to our fantastic students with great questions. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you and good luck to you all.